Hi everyone, thank you for joining our Communications, Media, and Entertainment Industry Forum at the Data and AI Summit. I'm Michael Ortega from the Industry Marketing Team here at Databricks, and I'll be your host today. We have an amazing group of industry leaders here to share their perspectives on how data and AI are helping media companies adopt direct consumer models and drive better engagement through personalized experiences. With that in mind, I'm excited to hand it off to our first speaker today, Steve Sobel. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our Media and Entertainment Industry Forum. Very excited that you could join us. My name is Steve Sobel. I'm the Global Industry Leader for Communications, Media, and Entertainment at Databricks. We're very excited to share with you a bit about what we're seeing in the market, as well as uh, hear from some of our customers uh, on some of the big data and AI challenges that they're solving for within their organization. Uh, and then we'll also uh, hear a bit more about uh, ways that you can get started quickly around common use cases uh, that we're seeing with Databricks. Before we uh, get started here, a couple of housekeeping items. First, uh, your connection will be muted. As you have questions, feel free to submit them in the chat panel here. Um, questions will be answered at the very end of our session today, as time provides. Uh, if we run over, we will uh, answer any questions with you offline, so uh, definitely feel free to ask away. And um, for those of you who uh, can't make the full session, the session will be recorded and will be available uh, upon request. Um, our agenda for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing and what we're doing in the media and entertainment space, some trends, as well as uh, some of the common use cases that we're seeing amongst our, our customers globally. We are very excited to have an expert panel about media and entertainment customers uh, for a roundtable discussion of kind of trends that they're seeing in the big data and AI space, uh, some interesting use cases that they're working on, uh, as well as, you know, kind of what they've learned around their journey uh, around, you know, data and AI being uh, the center of kind of um, um, their, their both consumer and advertiser strategy. So we have leaders from Investors Business Daily, Weather.com, uh, MIQ, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, who will join us shortly. And then last but certainly, certainly not least, we'll have a, a few uh, media experts with us from the Databricks team uh, to review a few different solution accelerators. We have Solution Accelerators, uh, a program uh, that you'll learn more about through this presentation, but we'll be showcasing work that we've done that we've made available to you um, around a few, a few different use cases, including uh, content recommendation, multi-touch attribution, and uh, toxicity in gaming and social. So got a great agenda for you. Hopefully you stay with us for 90 minutes and, uh, and uh, we will get going now. Um, so a bit about Databricks in case you uh, don't know us, and this is uh, the only slide you'll, you'll pretty much hear about us for, uh, for the rest of the time. But uh, Databricks, you know, we, uh, we are the big data and AI company. We have one platform that unifies the world of data engineering, data science, business analytics, so that you can have all of your data, make it ready for AI and BI, and do so exceptionally fast. Um, we're best known for a few different open source initiatives, namely uh, our six founders were the six founders of Apache Spark, uh, the big data processing engine uh, of choice for uh, most cloud-based enterprises across the globe. Uh, but we also have been the main contributors to a couple of other open source initiatives, namely Delta Lake, which is around uh, bringing more performance and reliability to your data lake, as well as MLflow, uh, which is a machine learning lifecycle tool. We work with companies of all shapes and sizes around the globe. We have now over 5,000 customers, uh, and many of you who are media and entertainment practitioners will be happy to know uh, media and entertainment is the largest um, uh, kind of our, our largest industry, and we're doing work across all facets of the industry, including gaming, broadcasting, agency, publishing, uh, and other components of the entertainment space. Um, you know, it's it, it's a bit trite to uh, to talk about you know the the last year of kind of what COVID has done uh, to the industry, um, but you know it's it's been a fascinating year to work with many of our customers because um, what has gone on right now around you know COVID uh, and kind of changing the way that we consume content, changing the way that um, you know, we advertise our brands, changing the way that, um, you know, our, our media companies go to market, you know, you, you literally, and these are just a few different uh, recent headlines that we've seen, but every facet of media has been disrupted over the last year. Um, and there are some open questions around, you know, what the future of media will look like, what will be the future of agencies, what's the future of, you know, direct to consumer content, what's the future of movie theaters, how we consume content, how we engage with experiences. Um, and we've seen this massive shift and this massive disruption that has gone on uh, across the industry and, and across all of the segments of the industry. And you're seeing right now many media companies that are responding to this disruption. And, um, you know, we've seen all sorts of statistics that, you know, COVID uh, kind of brought, you know, 10 years of transformation forward. 
uh, in 10 weeks. You see kind of how companies like Disney and Warner Media and NBC Universal have repivoted their business around direct to consumer rather than the traditional way that they've made money around advertising. Um, and there's, there's, you know, we see this across all different kinds of media companies in terms of how they're addressing this massive shift that we've seen over the last year and how these businesses have changed. First and foremost, you know, we see um, companies really doubling down on their investment in direct to consumer channels. So, um, you know, whether it's kind of broadcasters that are doubling down on direct to consumer, publisher, publishers continuing to amplify their investment around direct to consumer, um, you know, different kinds of uh, companies that, you know, were kind of making all of their revenue in advertising, evaluating how they move to more of a subscription model. And frankly, we're seeing, you know, companies really double down on how do they drive a frictionless, personalized experience with any consumer, any channel, any time. We're also seeing, you know, the, the kind of duopoly of Google and Facebook, uh, you know, kind of taking share away from incumbents in the market, you know, depending on what uh, survey or research you're looking at, you know, Facebook and Google own between 50 and 70 cents of every dollar that's spent on digital ad channels, which has made it more important for, uh, for you know, incumbents to diversify their advertising offerings uh, looking at different ways that they can monetize their content, whether, you know, um, looking at distribution uh, partners, looking at, you know, merchandising, looking at how they actually sell data uh, to, uh, to companies that are, are interested in, in kind of leveraging data uh, to kind of, again, uh, enhance their, their revenue strategy. So, you know, being able to monetize that end consumer experience in an agile fashion is, is more of a focus than, than ever before. And last but certainly not least, you know, many media companies have been put together by years of, you know, M&A activity. They're looking for cost synergy. They're looking for new revenue. They're looking for different partnerships. Agility and innovation is at the center of every investment that media companies are making right now. It's no longer acceptable for data organizations, IT organizations to be lagging the business. They have to be ahead of the business, creating platforms where the business can understand who's on the other side of their content. And ultimately, they can derive more value from, from the data that is pumping through uh, their organizations. While the ability to personalize, monetize, drive innovation and agility uh, is table stakes for many organizations, many media companies that we work with um, you know, are, are missing the promise of you know, machine learning and AI uh, simply because they don't have their data in a place where they can easily access it to derive more value from it from advanced data techniques. Um, you know, I, I talk to um, uh, IT and, and data executives all day, every day. Uh, a common refrain that I hear is, uh, it's not that we have a lack of data, it's that most of our data hits the floor. So we don't fully understand, you know, what is our customer lifetime value? How do we package our product to maximize our revenue opportunities? How do we best address um, and be better stewards of our advertising inventory or better stewards of our consumer experience to drive personalization uh, across channels. And when you get under the hood of what many data organizations are trying to build, it's very hard. You know, for your data engineers that are that are out there, you know, you are the heroes of, of many of these media organizations trying to build pipelines uh, that are performant to join batch and streaming data, trying to take data that is coming from your ad tech and martech stack and try to again, you know, create uh, put it in a performant way so that downstream data science and business analyst personas can derive value from it. So the challenges that many uh, within the, the uh, media and entertainment space face are, are, are hard and kind of getting to uh, high value use cases is even harder. Um, and ultimately, you know, that's kind of where Dataworks comes in to kind of help our customers. Um, I always like to say, you know, for, for laymen out there who are trying to understand what Dataworks does, uh, you know, our, my kind of elevator pitches, we have the ability to take all of your data, make it ready for AI and BI and do it exceptionally fast. Whether you run your infrastructure on AWS, Microsoft, or Google, uh, we have the ability to uh, sit within your, uh, your infrastructure environment, make your data lake more performant, more reliable, extend that data lake across data engineering, data science, data application use cases. And we also have customers that are extending our platform specifically for industry use cases. Uh, namely, you know, while, while we have hundreds of different use cases in the media and entertainment space, um, uh, you know, that, that customers are building on us, um, you know, we, we do see certain patterns uh, around kind of a majority of use cases falling into all things audience experience, advertising optimization, and how do you optimize the content lifecycle. Putting a bit more granularity on some of these use cases, 
Um, you know, again, a lot of the kind of investment that we're seeing for, uh, for media companies is in the world of how do they optimize uh, the audience experience in the direct to consumer uh, analytics and recommendation space. Whether it's customers that are building personalization engines, next best action, next best offer, uh, standing up use cases around GDPR, CCPA, COPA compliance. How do you mitigate churn, understand your customer life cycle? We're seeing massive amounts of investment of, of kind of how can you infuse ML and AI into the life cycle to help automate uh, and help keep your service as sticky as possible. In the advertising performance and optimization space, you know, what we've done in terms of building, you know, the best place in the world to run Apache Spark, but also with our, uh, our kind of investment in Delta Lake of bringing more performance and reliability around your, your real-time pipelines, we're seeing customers that are not only uh, being able to optimize their real-time reporting use cases for use cases like, you know, campaign performance, uh, or, or, you know, whether last touch or multi-touch attribution use cases, but we're also seeing customers that are using our capability around AI and ML to uh, really get to granular level segmentation, uh, really get to, um, you know, better uh, inventory and yield management use cases across their digital and linear channels. Uh, so again, you know, if, if for customers that are looking to kind of put more rigor around uh, their advertising business and kind of augment it with AI and ML, we're seeing uh, you know, tons of use cases across, you know, the digital space, broadcasting, publishing of, of customers that are investing in advertising use cases. And last but certainly not least, content life cycle. So these are use cases where, you know, uh, leveraging image, leveraging unstructured data, machine learning, uh, NLP, um, and the like to understand, you know, what is the performance of your content? How do you better package content? How do you understand, um, you know, for product development life cycle use cases, uh, how to drive, um, you know, understand how your features are performing um, in, in leveraging, you know, kind of uh, in computer, uh, computer vision use cases uh, to understand, you know, um, any sort of, you know, image or uh, profanity recognition for content localization use cases. What I would say, and one thing that um, we'll talk about uh, at the end of today's session is we at Databricks are um, seeing many of these common use cases and we're investing in building notebooks, building what we call solution accelerators that can help you unlock value around these use cases a lot faster. Um, so you'll see some examples of these use cases uh, at the end of today's session um, that, you know, again, you know, we're seeing these both for customers that are looking to start POCs with Databricks, but also customers that are looking uh, for help with uh, kind of accelerating their use case roadmap. All of this comes together. And, and again, you know, I mentioned, you know, we have customers across all facets of media. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, customers like Riot Games that are looking to optimize their real-time gamer experience or customers like Showtime that are looking to understand the value of their content uh, and understand, you know, what is the best way that they release content to maximize their value or what we're doing with Condé Nast, you know, one of the largest magazine publishers in the world where they're in the midst of a digital transformation moving, you know, from print first to digital first uh, and really leveraging Databricks to understand who's on the other side of their content how do they value their content, you know, based on who, the, who uh, their audience is and, and really help to, uh, you know, accelerate the innovation that they are driving around both their advertising and direct to consumer business. You know, we're doing these amazing real world use cases uh, across the ecosystem and uh, we're excited to showcase some of, uh, some of them with you today. With that, we're very excited to uh, kick off and introduce our, uh, our panel uh, to talk a little bit about uh, more about some of the, uh, the innovations that they're seeing and doing uh, with uh, with Databricks as their preferred partner for uh, for data and AI use cases. Thank you, Steve. That was great. Now it's time for a panel discussion with our esteemed group of data and AI leaders representing some of the largest global media and communications brands. Back to you, Steve, to introduce our panelists and kick off the discussion. Thank you for joining us today. We are thrilled to have you for our industry leadership panel. We have a, a esteemed panel of uh, data practitioners, data, data leaders, and uh, we're going to talk today about uh, trends that they're seeing in their business, trends that we're seeing overall in the media and entertainment space. Um, thrilled to welcome our panel, and uh, I, will, I will introduce them now. First, joining us uh, from Investors Business Daily, the head of data, uh, Sushi Lee. Joining us from Wetter.com, Karsten Herb, who is the technical lead for data products. From the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Jason Kim, who is the Senior Manager for BI and Predictive Modeling. And last but certainly not least, uh, Rohit Srivastava, uh, who is the Senior Engineering Manager from MIQ. Uh, before we uh, get into our panel today, just a few kind of uh, conversation points to, to tee up our conversation of 
just kind of things that um, that I'm seeing in the industry, that our team is seeing in the industry. Um, of course, you know, we've, we've had a very interesting uh, kind of uh, last time with organizations that are uh, kind of coming out of COVID have had to change their data strategy. There's a lot going on in the world of uh, privacy compliance, but just a few different um, observations that we're seeing right now. Um, first, you know, uh, things that uh, we're seeing kind of for customers that are in, uh, in the MarTech space, um, you know, we've had many customers, uh, you know, over many years talk about, you know, omni-channel experiences, omni-channel personalization. Uh, we've seen recently that, you know, many of uh, the customers that we're working with, many leaders within the entertainment space are really um, investing heavily in the omni-channel space, particularly when it comes to either building their own CDPs or augmenting CDPs that they're buying with ML and AI capability, really with the goal of moving beyond, you know, either, um, you know, kind of just communicating via email or communicating via two channels to having a fully real-time uh, omni-channel pipeline. Uh, hopefully something that uh, that some of our, our, uh, our panelists will talk about today in terms of the experiences that they're seeing. Second, uh, a big focus on privacy compliance, of course, with IDFA going away from Apple, uh, uh, Google moving away from cookie. We're seeing a lot of companies kind of shifting their, uh, their first party data strategy to uh, enhance their first party data, but also companies grappling with, with you know, how do we get to use cases around uh, measurement with kind of some of these tools going away. So another trend, hopefully, uh, that may, uh, we may tease out in our conversation with our leaders today. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, um, a massive investment in real-time use cases. Um, you know, when, when COVID started uh, a while ago, um, you know, of course, we, we saw, you know, massive demand in the direct-to-consumer media space, you know, whether it be gaming, whether it be uh, kind of the direct-to-consumer streaming video and audio space. Um, and with that came, you know, kind of a, a heightened uh, awareness, heightened investment in, you know, how do we compete with Netflix? How do we compete with Amazon around uh, you know, real-time, you know, recommendation, omni-channel experiences and the like. So just a few kind of observations of things that we're seeing uh, in the market before we uh, we kick off our conversation here. And, um, you know, to, to kick us off here, uh, you know, on this, on this virtual stage, um, you know, we've got, you know, a great number of leaders, uh, uh, you know, and kind of an interesting number of leaders, of course, uh, Sushi and Jason more in the uh, kind of direct-to-consumer, uh, you know, space uh, being, you uh, at uh, Investors Business Daily and CBC, and also a little bit of advertising. Uh, Karsten being in the B2B media space, uh, kind of selling uh, data products to, uh, to businesses and, uh, and Rohit, certainly in the agency space. So a, a real richness of uh, experience here. But, uh, you know, in, in a few cases, you know, and, and specifically uh, Sushi with you at IBD, I mean, you're supporting a few different revenue models, um, you know, and, and certainly for your business, you know, has been in, a, in the midst of transformation over the last few years. Uh, as you've shifted, you know, from kind of print to digital to uh, to really digital being at the core of uh, of everything that you're doing, um, you know, tell us more about you know what your team does and and the role of data and AI uh, as you've kind of been part of this transformation from you know print to being uh, digital first. Yeah, thank you for having me in this panel discussion, Steve. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sushiri. I'm head of data at Investors Business Daily, also known as IBD. IBD was founded by legendary investor William O'Neill in 1984. We provide stock research, stock news, stock list, and tools to help investors to make more money in the stock market. Um, similar to many other publishers, IBD went through the transition from the print-focused business to a digital-first subscription-focused business. During that process, data and the data capability has become more and more important to the success of the transition and this business. Since joined IBD in 2018, I have built a centralized data team, including data collection, data engineering, business intelligence, data science, machine learning engineer, and data governance to drive decision-making and digital transformation at IBD. Um, as you can see, the data team covers the end-to-end -end data life cycle, and it consists of data professionals with uh, very different you know, skill sets and experience. Um, we build Customer 360 in a cloud-based big data platform that process billions of data rows on daily basis. Um, we develop KPIs and the visualization of business metrics. We also build pretty models 
and personalization and scale to drive better customer experience and revenue growth. And today the data team has integrated with some of most important in a business process at IBD to support product development, marketing spending, traffic conversion, and customer retention. Awesome. Karsten, um, you know, you're the technical lead for data product at, uh, at weather.com, um, which in the, the doc region, it's the number one B2C weather portal. Um, you have 20 million unique users uh, a month. That's a huge audience. Um, you know, while you have massive B2C scale, I think you're unique in that, you know, you're leading, um, you know, have a team focused on monetizing data products for, for other industries, you know, like transportation, manufacturing, um, logistics and the like. Um, you know, many customers in this audience, you know, are coming from B2C companies that similarly are trying to figure out how do they monetize their platform, um, you know, for, for B2B type use cases. Um, you know, tell us more about, you know, um, how your team is supporting these, uh, these B2B revenue opportunities. Yes, yeah, Steve, sure. Um, well, around two years ago, our company asked, um, what can we do in addition to our traditional um, B2C business, which is mainly um, ad-based business? Um, so we thought, okay, we have a lot of data. How can we use this data to um, develop new products and build up a new business? And there we focus um, on the B2B business um, with uh, two different directions. Um, just selling or providing raw data is not really a good business case. Uh, it adds little value to our customers and it um, will bring little revenue for us. So we sort of combining the data we have with some um, analytical and machine learning methods um, to add more value. The first probably more obvious idea was um, to use our weather data, which is uh, no surprise. And we started to build uh, different forecasting solutions on it, um, where we enrich either sales or planning data for our customers with weather data, and then provide them with some uh, new forecasts or some weather correction factor to help them to improve their planning um, or their business. The second um, idea we had um, was uh, we not only have weather data from our mobile users, uh, we have quite amount of location data. And so we had the idea to develop analytical geo products on top of this data to provide uh, anonymized um, analytical products like visits to certain places, frequency uh, patterns, etc. Probably you have seen graphs like that uh, very frequently during the COVID time um, because people looked how mobility changes um, in different areas. And um, that's the second product we, we built. We did this um, by founding a new team. Um, we are a cross-functional team uh, ranging from IT specialists like data scientists, uh, data engineer to uh, business developers and salespeople. So we are a bit separated from our core business also, we heavily, of course, rely on the data that gets produced in the core business. Awesome. Um, pivoting, pivoting to another uh, B2C panelist here, Jason, you know, you're uh, from the CBC, largest news publisher in Canada, one of the best known public broadcasters in the world, uh, you know, spanning the worlds of television, radio, digital. Um, you know, clearly the last year in the broadcasting space, things have changed pretty drastically as everyone's, you know, very much doubled down on the direct to consumer market. Um, you know, the role of data and AI probably could not be more important for broadcasters now as they're trying to understand who's on the other side uh, of their content. You know, tell us a bit more about, um, you know, the your team, the role you play and, and um, you know, kind of how the CBC is driving a more consumer centered strategy. Uh, def definitely all the, all the things that you just said are, are definitely true for us. Um, we, like basically the core mission of the CBC um, is to ensure that we are relevant to all people living in Canada uh, and also upholding our public uh, service mission to inform and entertain uh, our audiences, right? And so what, is, what does that mean in this world of like COVID and big data and so on? And so basically um, I think the way I see it and, and the way we see it at the CBC is that um, uh, we want to generate as much audience value as possible. Uh, uh, and, and it's really the audience and our advertisers that are our most valuable asset uh, rather than just data, right? And so when we ask for data or collect data or use data, it's done with these two um, 
uh, uh, key, key uh, partners in mind, our audience and the advertisers, right? And so um, uh, the CBC has like one of the largest clickstream um, event data sets uh, in the country. We have 4 million uniques on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, as you said, we are an omni-channel operation. So we're on linear television. We, are, we have an online streaming service. We have digital audio, we have podcasts, we're on every single device, smart speakers, smart TVs, uh, phones, uh, you name it, right? And so um, uh, there is a lot of data, there's no, there's no shortage of that. Um, but um, uh, within all that is sort of uh, like personalization. That's, that's what ties everything together. Um, what, it mean, what does it mean for the CBC to be relevant to everyone in Canada? it means to deliver a personalized experience, right? Um, to, be, to, to develop that deep relationship uh, with, with every Canadian. Um, and what does that mean from a data perspective? That means being able to leverage all the data that we have about our audience uh, to, to deliver on that experience, right? Uh, uh, a truly personal, useful, entertaining experience. Uh, and so, um, at every step of the way, with every product that we develop, with every show that we produce, uh, uh, we think about the audience first, uh, and the, how we use the data is done in the service of that audience. That that's basically the frame of, of everything that we do in digital uh, at the CBC. Awesome. And then last but not least, Rohit, um, you know, MIQ uh, is a programmatic partner for for marketers and advertisers. You know. Clearly, the programmatic space, uh, you know, it's moved from buzzword to being core to uh, many marketers, um, you know, uh, media strategy, um, it, you know, and, and frankly, you know, you're seeing a lot of brands that are moving a lot more to programmatic, you know, simply for more addressability, more scale. Um, you know, tell us a bit more about, you know, where MIQ sits in the pro programmatic value chain and, um, and what, you know, your role is, um, you know, from a data perspective there. Yeah, sure, sure, Steve. And, and I was just hearing uh, Karsten and then I kind of felt that I also wanted to start in a similar tone and uh, he, he kind of took to two to three years back, right? Uh, for us also, I think if you see the whole uh, programmatic media space, I mean, uh, there has been a big amount of change in the last two to three years. I mean, and, and the uh, behavior of consumers are changing. It's, it's diversified. I mean, uh, be it mobile, be it tablet, we're talking about on the channel. It has changed drastically in the last three to four years. And, and uh, for us, uh, I think uh, an interesting thing I, I kind of wanted to discuss was that we were typically uh, started as a uh, uh, trading agency uh, company, right? Where you want to run a campaign, you come to MIQ, MIQ starts a campaign with you and we try to uh, get the best reach, better disability uh, based on our technology. But uh, I think the last three to four years uh, uh, back, we kind of entered uh, into individual uh, product solutions. Uh, what I mean by that is that we started building uh, teams for uh, TV. We started building teams, separate team for hyperlocal. We started building separate team for identity link, right? Uh, because uh, uh, as I said, I mean, in the last two to three years, uh, including privacy, there has a lot of, I mean, there has been a lot of innovation around these. And uh, we were doing it in very silos uh, and combined, and we're not selling the solutions before. So uh, I think evolution of my team in the last three years have been around these product where uh, each of these product solutions, TV, identity, hyperlocal, Measurement, measurement being uh, in itself a very complicated terminology with ad tech. So uh, what my team uh, does is that uh, there are a set of data engineers who are working in all these spots and uh, uh, data scientists are accompanied with them, right? And uh, we sell TV-based intelligence. We said uh, we sell uh, hyperlocal slash motion-based intelligence. And that's where uh, partnering with uh, data sets around all of these uh, domains, TV domains, uh, hyperlocal domains, et cetera. And that's where I think uh, my team uh, comprises of data engineer and data scientist, where uh, uh, both of these two work in pair to make sure that we build right sort of pipeline uh, with right sort of product, uh, I mean, predictive modeling, uh, ultimately making sure that the campaigns we have are, are serving the right purpose with right set of uh, uh, targeting the audience. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's how I'd like to summarize that, uh, how a data engineering team for me in the last two, 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 three years has uh, evolved for us. You, uh, you're, you're giving me a good segue because you, uh, you had mentioned uh, in your remarks privacy and uh, clearly everyone on this call, you know, whether it's, um, you know, IDFA going away, whether it's, you know, Google shifting away from third party cookies, uh, whether it's, you know, things like, you know, compliance regimes like GDPR, CCPA, COPA coming into place, um, you know, this is probably, you know, the number one hair on fire issue for, for all, of, uh, all of us that are in the, uh, the data space. Um, you know, Karsten, 
Uh, starting with you, you know, as a, as a team that's selling data products to other businesses, I'm sure, you know, privacy, uh, you know, is top of mind for, for how, uh, how you guys are, are operating. Um, you know, tell us a bit more about, you know, your approach to privacy requirements and, um, and you know, what, what the role of, you know, big data AI is in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of, you know, uh, complying. Yeah, well, of course, um, data privacy and GDPR um, has always been in, in the core for our company and so also for our B2B products um, that especially for the weather data, well, we don't have a big privacy um, issue. That's not real private data, but for the location and geo data, of course, this is prior data. And there we work with anonymized data and um, build analytical products based on aggregations so you can attract single individuals um, which is something we definitely want don't want to do and want to in the future and uh, yeah of course but all the other recent changes like um, apple's att and uh, tcf 2.0 these have kept um, our mobile and web team really busy on the technical side quite recently um, looking at the business impact um, I think nobody knows and can tell at the moment. Um, for us in the B2B team, um, this even might open some new opportunities. Um, so because with one of our product, um, we calculate so-called weather indices. That means um, we use machine learning method to predict the impact the local weather has um, on how different product groups um, like ice cream, water, beer, clothing, etc. We, we have uh, tons of them uh, are sold. And um, this uh, measure of impact the weather has on certain product groups um, is already used um, on um, ad programming platforms. Uh, where you can um, optimize your ad spendings, just uh, showing your ads to users that are in the region where the weather makes it more likely that the user will buy your product. Um, or you can use this information to change your ads and um, show information or products to user that are more likely to sell um, depending on the weather he is currently on. So, um, and with uh, the, yeah, decrease of uh, personalized advertisement. Um, I think this contextual um, advertisement uh, will gain an, an, an importance. And uh, we hope to help uh, our customers um, to make the best out of it. Awesome, and that's a, that's a, a good segue to Rohit. You know, uh, Carson, you're on, you're on one end of the transaction kind of giving the, the data to actually do the targeting and then uh, the, the the actual uh, the 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 you know Rohit with MIQ, you guys are actually you know executing on the on the campaigns. I would assume uh, privacy is top of mind for you guys. <laughs> tell us tell us a bit more about you know how you guys are, are thinking about this. Yeah, yeah, and and, and probably that's uh, that's the first thing. Uh, uh, and every time we see our roadmap, we have items focused around uh, the privacy. Uh, I mean, most of the times and. Uh, I think uh, we have been quite prepared. I mean, this industry has made sure that uh, uh, all these announcements, be it GDPR coming in or even Google removing the use of the third party cookies. I mean, I would say that they've kept us prepared in advance and uh, uh, that's a good bit. And at least one, one and a half years back when we know that something like GDPR was coming in. And, and for us as a business, it's a, it's a big thing. I mean, uh, for us on a daily basis, we get data from almost 125 different data providers, right? And and. The world where third-party cookies uh, existed and you actually could go and target individually, which is a typical uh, uh, user targeting. So uh, I think it was a big, a, a big change for us uh, as, a, uh, as a business. Uh, and uh, we were quite anticipated. We had to go back and we kicked off a project uh, within our, uh, I mean, our technology team, uh, which is still running and we call it data minimization, which meant that uh, all the feeds and all the data providers that we're getting, we need to make sure that we are P2 compliant. It's a GDPR regulated. Uh, column. So uh, uh, three months uh, to four months of a, a dedicated work that went from data engineers as well as some of the software engineers to make sure that we build uh, that layer of minimization where you make sure that you're, you're feeding something uh, into the uh, into your system, which is well governed, right? And then there is a, a landing zone, then there is a raw zone, and then there is actually a privacy zone, and then actually the aggregated zone. So building this uh, kind of whole layer, and, and, and we used uh, Databricks to some, I mean, great level of extent where uh, the whole Delta Lake offering and uh, as we talk, we're actually moving to the, towards the lake house architecture, uh, the state of bricks offer where this whole thing is kind of getting revamped into that. But yeah, I mean, uh, three to four months to make sure that all our feeds that we have uh, kind of aligns to that. 
and uh, yeah i mean uh, building some of the other utilities around that also uh, for example a lot of uh, advertisers who came a lot of our clients who came they also wanted wanted us to build very customer uh, custom utilities for them for example i remember uh, one of the uh, clients came to us and said that can you build an opt in service and opt out service for us so that we can make sure that the guys who are opting out how do you go ahead and delete them from a 20 terabytes of data space and 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 ideally uh, your whole app systems have been known not to be transactional right and as i mentioned that's where we are moving towards delta lake which is kind of building uh, the whole transactional uh, system into the whole database ecosystem so yeah at least uh, with gdpr that was the case uh, i think uh, with respect uh, to third party cookies if i may i think uh, we were again uh, prepared i would say uh, i we were dependent a lot on third party cookies but uh, the golden part of this whole thing is uh, uh, people have to also realize that it's not only first party cookies you also have a concept of second party cookies and 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 there are a lot of companies like uh, uh, one we are heavily invested in it's called infosum and they have uh, come with a very unique concept of differential privacy right and and the whole concept of being able to merge your first party data as well as second party data and and they name it data bunkers uh, to make sure that we are uh, private yet i'm able to give you the data and information you need so uh, a lot of uh, uh poc is a uh, lot of uh, talking to their technical engineers to understand how infosim works bringing some of that uh, uh, kind of differential privacy uh, probabilistic joints all of these things into our ecosystem i think a lot has changed but for good and i think um, uh, we, we were just discussing yesterday that uh, be it gdpr or any compliance i think these are meant to bring us bring us to a lot of innovation and interesting times yeah data bunkers i like that i'm i'm going to steal that one um <laughs> jason you know, for you guys, um, you know, you guys are sitting on a lot of first party data. Um, you know, tell us, tell us a bit more about, you know, your approach to all this, you know, and, and kind of how it's changed, you know, your overall strategy on, on, you know, what kind of data you're, you're looking at and kind of overall the, the strategy. Yeah, I think, um, this is a very uh, hot button topic uh, for us and other uh, digital media companies because much of our revenue is ad supported. Um, while uh, we are also uh, obviously uh, in the business of serving our audience, right? And so we inevitably have tensions between like what advertisers want versus what audiences want, right? Um, and, and what they deserve, right? And so, um, uh, definitely the, the death of the third party cookie and other things that are happening. Um, there's, there's a lot of anxiety and sort of work uh, swirling around that. Um, I think we haven't quite thread the needle on that yet. Uh, and I, I don't think uh, there's a, a publisher or digital media company out there that, that can say that they have. But um, the way that we're approaching it right now is, is, is as follows, right? So Unlike many other news media organizations um, who are doubling down on subscription revenue, right? Um, we, we can't do that, right? Because we have a public service mission to serve all Canadians, not just people who can pay for the news, right? And so um, what that looks like in our products and the way we approach the collecting of our uh, users' data is, is, is like this, right? So, um, it, it's, it's creating a fundamental shift in the way we think about product development, as well as uh, about uh, monetizing our audience's data. So, so I'll give you an example. Um, uh, many applications and news media, uh, 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 digital media products are asking increasingly for uh, certain like demographic details, right? Um, uh, which obviously very plainly benefit the advertiser uh, but don't necessarily benefit the audience. And, and we think uh, that that is a fundamental uh, uh, problem and flaw if, if, if your product is like that, right? Um, and so, and, and that, that statement might get, get me into trouble. So hopefully no one at the CBC uh, is, is watching this, right? Um, but um, uh, basically, um, I think the way things are shifting in our digital products is, yes, we need to collect and ask for uh, 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 data from our audience uh, so that uh, they can be more um, effectively monetized. Uh, um, but at the same time, the audience needs to get something equally or more valuable in return for the exchange of data, right? Um, and by the way, uh, serving more personalized ads is not like real value uh, being returned to the audience, right? Um, and, and so that has really challenged us to think about 
the way we introduce new features or new content or new products uh, to our audience uh, uh, by, by asking the question, okay, how can we immediately leverage what the audience is giving us to creating a visibly and transparent, uh, better, transparently better audience experience for them, right? So if we're asking for say geolocation data because um, uh, advertisers wants to, want to be able to like geotarget uh, people, right? Um, okay, so we, we have that business reason for doing that, but what is, what is the audience reason for doing that? Right, so if we if we ask for geo data, we have we should have in our app or in our news website something that is totally personalized to that specific location, right? Um, and so I, I like to use the example of like Chekhov's gun, which is this like literary principle where when a writer introduces an element in a story, it creates an expectation. So if you talk about a gun that gun better go off, right? Or, or it shouldn't be in the story, right? And so it's the same thing when we ask for data from our audience. If we're asking for something from the audience, it needs to be immediately apparent what the audience has to gain and the experience that, that is in front of them should reflect that, right? So if I'm giving you my zip code or postal code, I expect to be hearing about news from that area, right? I, I, that, that it creates an expectation and to not deliver on that expectation uh, is not only providing a false promise to the audience in the, in the long term, it will lead to a, a breach of trust, right? And like I said, off the top, our relationship to the audience as, as a media company is the most important thing to protect. Uh, 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 it, so we approach it from the perspective of that rather than trying to maximize how much data that we collect from our audience. Cause we know that, if we can align audience needs with advertiser needs, and that's reflected in our products, uh, everything will sort itself out. That's a good uh, sushi. I mean, you're you're in the same boat with Jason, and and Jason, I love what you said. Like, it's all about a value exchange, and I think that it's something that a lot of us miss. <laughs> um, you know, sushi. How have you guys approached this? I mean, you're you're similar in that. You know, you've you've got advertising product, you've got subscription product, you have a lot of first party data. Um, you know, tell us, tell us, you know, kind of what, what this has meant for you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most of our revenue is from, um, subscription business. So, uh, but still, right. Ad revenue is an important part of our revenue source. Um, yeah, with the third party cookie go away in the near future, um, I believe most of the publishers will put more emphasis on collecting the first party data and find ways right, to monetize that first party data. But also as James mentioned, we want to do that in a way to, right, so that we give value to our customers. Um, right now we are actively evaluating and testing new ways of identifying different audience on our digital property and connect them with relevant advertisers. Um, I think the new approach can, potentially, uh, right, change how we think and operate at sales at IBD. One thing for sure is that a data will play a central role in the process and also, right, in the coming quickly forward. In my opinion, there are two major changes from data and AI perspective. One is that we're going to expand the first party data we used in ad sales. Um, before this, right, we, when we think about first party data, we usually think about, okay, the declared data from our members. Right? When we collect some demographic information or um, their trading behavior information from our customers and use that data in our sales. But in the future, we'll start to collect more behavior and content consumption data from our members, but also from our Right, anonymous customers. Now, most of our customers right, visit our website anonymous. So suddenly we're talking about tens of gigs of data every day. And then that's a lot of you know, data volume is huge. And then of course we need a, a data platform to process that data. And also right, the way we build our audience can be different. 
And we're going to leverage the data we collected from our members, right? We understand their demographic, their interest and their preference and their behavior and the content consumption. And then we also compare that with our anonymous customers, right? To identify yeah, their behavior and content consumption, find the pattern, right? And then develop an audience. Um, so as a result, I think data science and AI will be integrated more closely into the new sales process. Awesome. You you mentioned scale, um, and you mentioned uh, you know real time. Uh, you know this is a a challenge for you know we oftentimes you know we at DataWorks are, are working with companies simply to address challenges around scale in real time. Um, you know, Jason, pivoting back to you for a sec. Um, you know, for for you know B two C media companies, um, you know their scale is the name of the game, and specifically as it relates to driving personalization, personalized experiences. You, you've kind of talked about this a little already, but you know, tell us a little bit about you know, some of the challenges that you've had in addressing scale and addressing kind of you know, real-time or, or near real-time use cases. Yes, um, like this, it, 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 it's, we're in a, quite a funny situation. Like I mentioned that we have a very high reach. Uh, uh, we reach like roughly 70% of all Canadians. Um, on a monthly basis. And like I mentioned, we have 4 million uniques uh, a day. Uh, and certainly in this heightened uh, period with COVID and uh, everything that's going on in the world, uh, our reach has never been higher, right? And so that is uh, lead, that's sort of accelerating this sort of big data problem that we have, where we have massive amounts of data being generated in a variety of ways uh, at rapid uh, velocity. Uh, um, uh, but unlike companies that are similar, like Google or Facebook, that have like massive reach, we don't have the resources they do to solve this problem, which they did a long time ago when they um, uh, became ubiquitous, right? And so, um, uh, and so we're we're sort of seeing the echoes of what happened there uh, uh, with us, uh, uh, in, in as as like a broadcaster that's transitioning into the into. A, a, a digital media company with massive reach, right? And so um, platforms like Databricks really en enable us to quickly stand up a solution with very minimal investment. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to have the engineering expertise that Google and Facebook did when they uh, uh, solved the big data problem uh, for themselves, right? Um, and so uh, uh, we're just like really beginning solving the problem. Uh, um, and and the, we're, the way we're approaching this is that uh, is is by keeping an eye on like the 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 near future, right? So uh, in many media organizations, uh, just just BI is like a new practice, right? Or or an emerging practice, right? Uh, using data analytics to and descriptive analytics to uh, drive uh, performance or engagement on your on your platform, right? Um, that is stuff that we are doing and we need to stand up, but that is not actually the end goal uh, or, or uh, vision for, for my team, for example, right? Uh, uh, we're seeing emerging technologies like customer data platforms, the shift to first party data, as, as we just talked about, uh, uh, the importance of publishers like ourselves who can't double down on subscriptions to uh, really focus on growing its authenticated user base from from anonymous, right? Um, uh, and so uh, the the way I see things is that um, uh, the challenge is um, providing insights uh, and valuable information where our stakeholders are working. Um, so, for example, when we're working with journalists and the news is breaking. Uh, 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 our insights need to need to be able to move at the pace as fast as the news is breaking, right? And so, um, I think in a number of years, although uh, uh, the newsroom, um, for example, is becoming just acquainted with uh, data analytics, BI, and things like that, uh, in the near future, uh, these will be things that will be delivered directly to them. Say, at the moment, uh, a piece of content is published, right? Uh, and so that. Uh, insights are being pushed rather than journalists are being pulled to like, say, our dashboards, or our data platform, right? And so um, 
uh, when it comes to working with product developers, I think, I think that is also going to be the case. So um, the products will reflect the agility of our audience. Like if something, something that I've learned in my time at the CBC and especially during this time uh, of COVID is that the audience is very attuned to like what's going on, right? Like they're very opportunistic, right? And very sensitive uh, to the effect of the news cycle, right? And so um, how can we deliver insights uh, based on the data that we have from our audience that's coming in at the moment these things break? Uh, how can we deliver them to product managers and product developers to uh, uh, enhance their products based on what's happening on the ground right now, rather than some product roadmap that was developed maybe uh, 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 three months ago, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, we're just starting that journey uh, uh, and we aren't, we aren't living in that future where like uh, of embedded analytics and, and uh, uh, truly agile uh, development. Uh, 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 but um, the way I see it is that we're using Databricks and the BI practice to build the scaffold uh, that supports that future. Rohit, for you, I mean, you're in the programmatic space, like <laughs> programmatic is real time. It's the definition of, of real time use cases. Um, you know, tell us a bit more about, you know, some of the challenges that, that you've had to address. Yeah, and, 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 and as you truly said, right, it's, it's one of the core of our business. I mean, if we are not able to target a particular user when we need to, which, which apparently is becoming real time these days, I mean, uh, we are a bit time loss. And uh, I mean, a lot of things you can talk about, I'd probably pick one incident, right? I mean, uh, we have one of the, uh, one of our products, which we call Capture internally, right? And uh, what uh, we are into a place where uh, we have uh, uh, companies or the advertisers working with us where they allow us to place pixels on their website uh, uh, based on the page, check in, check out, check out, order, et cetera, right? And then you get the data. And uh, the moment that data has come to us, we cannot wait for more than, let's say, five seconds or 10 seconds to understand uh, the consumer behavior, of the guy uh, of the individual or a segment of users who have done some activity on that page, target them back based on the contextual targeting, right? And uh, going slightly technical here, I think uh, uh, this product for us, uh, which involves that real-time targeting has evolved over time. And, uh, ha and so has evolved the technical stack that has gone behind it, right? Uh, and, and if I have to summarize, I think uh, we have done kind of a version three rollout of this project, three versions in the last four years, uh, which means that initially we had a bandwidth where we could, uh, we could had a luxury of 45 seconds to 50 seconds. I mean, advertisers have grown up. I, uh, it, uh, this was the case in 2016, 2018, they came back with, not more than 25 seconds, 30 seconds. And today where it stands is that our SLA, usually that we promise to our advertisers for a predictive uh, reback targeting is not more than eight to 10 seconds, right? And um, each of these three SLAs, not one technology has been able to uh, uh, kind of reach there. Uh, as has the use case evolved, such as the uh, kind of technology layer uh, that has evolved in this case. And that's where I think Databricks plays a very heavy, heavy role uh, in these case, right? At least the last two solutions that we have built, both of them are on Databricks. And, and what Jason says, I think I very rightly said that uh, Databricks tries to help us build with a minimal engineering resource at the same point of time with a minimal uh, I mean, kind of cost associated to that, right? And the innovation continues. Uh, I think uh, innovation continues as, as, as I was saying that uh, the last time when we had built it was on a Databricks offered X solution, uh, which is a typical uh, Spark streaming solution. And now when we are building it, uh, uh, there is a lake house architecture powered by Delta where uh, uh, we are able to see and meet and give the eight to 10 seconds of response to our users. And uh, yeah, as I said, I think real time, uh, this is a use case where we have to target users real time, but there is another angle, which is real time bidding. Uh, the real time bidding, uh, building that RTB engine uh, into progressive media uh, landscape. That's another whole set of a challenge. And that in itself also depending on uh, how quickly we can bid on which particular DSP is, uh, is, is changing over time. And uh, yeah, not to get into details, I think these are uh, some of uh, the things that I wanted to share that it's about uh, user behavior, consumer behavior changing, but at the same point of time, the need demand of SLA that continues to change with advertisers. And then how uh, uh, we continue to scale our technologies to meet them. I think that's that's have been uh, fundamentally our core in the last three to four years. Awesome. Sushi, um, <clears throat> turning to you, I mean, you, you both have a ad business, a, a subscription business. You have consumers that are looking for, you know, want the gratification of real-time recommendation, things like that, you know. Tell us a bit more about, um, you know, your approach to uh, agility scale in, in real time. 
Yeah, um, scale and agility definitely is very important to uh, our business as a B2C digital right, business. Uh, and I want to focus on uh, agility here anymore. Um, yeah, so basically yeah, we need to um, respond quickly to our customers changing needs and preference. Um, and also we are right, a small company and with startup, startup mentality and our marketing team can launch a campaign from ideation from go live in a day, right? And, and also we regularly add new features and launch new products. So to keep up with the fast pace of the business, um, the data team also need to have platform, right? To enable us to get data, right? Have access to data and process data and develop reports or insights quickly. Before we deploy to Databricks, that process usually took us weeks or sometimes even months, right? And just to bring some new data right into our data warehouse, build the table, right? And then, you know, check the data quality, you know, run analysis. That's just uh, you know, too slow. And that's a bottleneck to the business, especially if you want to become a data-driven uh, right, business. So now after we deployed Databricks um, and also um, I expanded my team to hire data engineer, now we can you know, bring the data into our data platform and make it available for data scientists and the BI team in just a few days. Okay? Um, so that you know, greatly improved efficiency um, of the team and also speed up the process right, from data to insights. And, and Karsten, I mean, is a is a I mean, you guys are in the business of weather. <laughs> Probably not a not a more critical business where you know timeliness, agility, you know, being able to scale is uh, is that is more important. You know, tell us a bit more about you know how your kind of approach to uh, to some of this as well. Yeah, well, um, we, are, we are quite lucky as uh, Wettercom is already completely on um, AWS for a couple of years now. Um, so for us as a B2B data team, we, we started directly just uh, using native uh, cloud service, uh, using serverless services um, in order to be able to try out things fast, but um, also, of course, to be able to fix, uh, to, to scale if, if required and um, being able to try out things um, immediately. Um, regarding real-time data, uh, we have a lot of streaming data, but real-time is not that important for us. Um, what's more important for us is, um, and that's actually the reason why we use Databricks, is to make the overall development uh, cycle faster. And the bottleneck in, in our company, it's, it's the manpower we have. We are not uh, such a huge team. Um, so we really have to think about what's the best way to use uh, the human resources we have on the project and um, to iterate uh, quite fast from a first trial um, or a first POC with a customer to uh, a product uh, that scales um, uh, across uh, huge data sets. And uh, that's why we needed a platform where our data scientists can easily um, analyze the data and uh, try things out without a lot of restrictions, without having to care about infrastructure or scale. That's why we started using Spark from the beginning. But also for our engineers, um, we want to keep the, the operational load we have on, on the team quite low. and. Um, they are not only serverless technology helped us a lot. Uh, what uh, we really like to use and which really improved the way uh, we, we, we ran our data pipelines was introduction of data tables because this Lakos approach um, enabled us to do data maintenance jobs that are quite easy in a relational database, like doing some delete or update, um, doing this um, on scale um, on, on the data on, on our data lake and uh, therefore reducing the, the, the effort you have to put into some maintenance jobs and uh, reducing the time it takes to run these jobs so that we can, everyone has more time to focus on the development on new features. 
and as we are in the early phase of, of our business and of our product development, it's of course very important to react fast to learn from our clients or customers and react fast and to adapt our products. And um, this is the cycle we have been able to uh, speed up with the use of Databricks. Awesome. And uh, we are we're we are over time. We're we're short on time actually. So uh, we'll we'll do a final lightning round here. Um, you know, a couple of you have mentioned Lakehouse. Of course, we at Databricks are very excited about like Lakehouse as an overriding architecture. But um, you know, in in thirty seconds or less for each of you, just um, if you could give you know what what's kind of a a use case or innovation that you're most excited about working with your team over the next twelve months. And I'll start with uh, I'll start with Karsten. Um, okay, uh, we, we, our data scientists and business developers have, have many fancy ideas of what we can do with all the data we have. And I think uh, we can try out uh, all the different uh, machine learning algorithms there are. But um, what, what I'm personally more excited about it is um, which way do we find to make use of the data products we already have and uh, collaborate with our customers or partners. Um, to, to make uh, some business value for them. And um, we started with uh, advertising platforms and, and now we're looking to extend to other industries, to resource planning platforms. And I'm, I'm really curious what uh, will be happen in the next 12 months. Awesome. Sushi? Yeah, so in the next uh, 12 months, uh, two things I think we'll, you know, we'll focus on. Um, one thing is that build up our uh, you know, rapid reporting uh, from our uh, data you know, link house or like data link. Um, we used to use Tableau right, for a reporting purpose, but the cycle is too long and it really takes weeks. Um, I want to develop a process that we can get, out, get report out in a few days. Um, the second thing is we're working on real-time personalization um, and customization on our website um, so that we can help our visitors right, uh, to uh, present more relevant content to them and, and show the value to them. Um, and we want to tailor that experience based on whether they're new or repeat customers and also based on their different interests. Um, those are the two major things we'll focus on. Awesome, Jason? I think more than any, like any kind of like data product, like a data model or algorithm or prediction model or whatever, I think what excites me most in the next 12 months is really about um, how uh, this new data lake uh, that we've implemented through Databricks will enable uh, stronger and better collaboration uh, amongst the different uh, product content and uh, data teams uh, at the CBC. Um, I think uh, uh, we've already had an upswell of interest from like multiple stakeholders uh, from all corners of the company uh, into seeing what we have uh, developed in data and Databricks and Delta Lake. Uh, and um, all the things that I've talked about, like the product changes, the, the changes in business strategy, uh, how we approach advertising and monetization in the data in the future. Um, I think it's sort of all coming together uh, this year. Uh, uh, on top of the context that we're all in with the pandemic and, and, and sort of that's, that's what I'm most excited about, seeing how all of these things come together, uh, technology, data, our audience, uh, and shifting uh, business strategy uh, 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 and how it all unfolds in the next year. Awesome. And Rohit? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I would probably resonate with Jason and, and in a land, and programmatic landscape, I would say, I think this year is the cookie list, uh, uh, how does the cookie list world look to us, right? And and we have a very strong focus on uh, things. We should be able to reach out uh, our advertisers and publishers in the same way we were able to reach out when there were third-party cookies. And how do you master that with a lot of innovations? I think Databricks is going to play a very vital role. As I said, lake house architecture, building our clean room solutions, doing data lake analytics over at least six to, um, I mean, seven different disjoint data sets to figure out a meaning out of it, which can resonate with our advertiser and uh, our publishers. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, in a very simple words, I think cookie less is our prime focus that how do we uh, establish ourselves as a business and uh, maintain the same level of uh, confidence that our clients have, uh, even uh, be it third party or no third party. 
Awesome. Well, well, thank you all for for sharing both kind of what you're excited about, but in general sharing, you know, what what uh what you're seeing in your businesses. A really fascinating discussion. Uh, while while all of you are different, it seems like we have a lot of commonality, common issues uh, uh, that we're all trying to solve here. So uh, can't thank you guys enough for uh, for sharing your insights with us today. What a great discussion. Thank you, Steve and our panelists. Now we're excited for the last portion of our industry forum where we'll showcase a couple of our solution accelerators for popular data and AI use cases in the media industry. Our first demo comes from Duncan Davis, solutions architect at Databricks. He will discuss the impact of toxic behavior on the gaming experience and show you how to curb toxic players with machine learning. Now to you, Duncan. Hey everyone. So my name is Duncan Davis and what I wanted to talk about today was how we can tackle toxicity in the gaming uh, community in the gaming industry with machine learning. And I'm going to start off with talking about the impact of toxicity, like why, why it's important that we start addressing this and ways that we can handle it. So from a long-term player retention, um, studies have shown that 80% of gamers recently experienced toxicity in within the last past couple of months. And 20% of players said that toxicity caused them to quit playing that game. And not only that, but most of the players that had impacted by the toxicity, a tenth of them said that it actually resulted in, in depression and suicidal thoughts. So we've got a really big issue on long-term player churn, as well as the mental health of our gaming community. From a short-term player retention, Players who faced exposure were over three times more likely to churn mm. and never come back and play that game. So first sessions um, in games are super important. And if they're encountering toxicity during this, it obviously is going to uh, make it even a, a worse experience for them. And then the third being brand image. So in the gaming community, everyone's aware that communities end up getting branded uh, helpful or or enjoyable to start for new people. And some games actually end up getting branded um, as being a community full of toxic individuals. And some of this even extends outside of the gaming world where a th one in three players have been doxxed where the personal information have been brought outside of the game where someone was able to find um, information about them or their family and it became a real life issue, not just a gaming issue. And when we look at a particular instance of this, uh, Behavior Interactive, who made Dead by Daylight, actually did a great job at, at really showcasing the, for their game what interactions the players would have and, and how toxic they were. So you can see they took their mechanics and interactions that the players had in their multiplayer game, and they made a matrix out of it. And on the left, you can see the less toxic. And on the right, you can see the most toxic encounters that they have. And on the top, they have their survivors. And the bottom, their killers, which is their two different types of roles that the players play when, when playing the game. And we can see on the far right that leading out of all of the other mechanics, text chatting, um, and I highlighted it here, was shown to be the most toxic and it encountered the most players as well. So the survivors have more players in the match than you know, killers. So more players were experiencing their most toxic mechanic. The other common types of interactions, and some are listed here, are things like voice, as well as game-specific events, such as lobby, dodging, disconnecting, activating emotes for unintended reasons um, that can... Uh, negatively impact the, the uh, experience of the players. But today we're going to focus around text chatting. And I'm going to hop over into Databricks. And we're going to leverage the new repos feature. And in the first notebook in this solution accelerator, we are going to download and prepare our data. So we have two different data sets that we're leveraging here. One being Google's jigsaw data set around toxicity, which includes training and test data. And this is gonna cover common English uh, language words um, that have been found in, in multiple scenarios, not just gaming, uh, but multiple scenarios across the internet and companies in their own company. Um, words and phrases that are considered 
toxic and the different types of toxicity, such as severe, toxic, obscene, threat, insult, and identity hate. So we're going to leverage uh, Kaggle to download these data sets. And this is this first notebook is, is preparing that. Uh, we're, the second data set that we're going to leverage is um, also on Kaggle. It's a Dota 2 match data set. So this is 50,000 uh, um, of their matches and the data surrounding those matches, such as um, the chat, the, the player stats, the summary, um, things that were happening in the game at that time. We're going to download both of these. And, and through here, that Kaggle API interaction that we have is going to download the uh, zipped files to the driver node. And that leads us into the second notebook in which we're going to take those downloaded uh, data sets. We're actually going to load those into our, our lake house, um, particularly in Delta in the lake house. So you can see we're going to create a gaming database just so we can separate the data out from the rest of our data. And we're going to move the, the training and test data and then load this into a Delta Lake. And we do that um, because Delta is, is, is the most performant uh, storage format. But we also get a unified batch and streaming capabilities. We get schema enforcement. Um, and, and particularly when we're training models, we get to do time travel capabilities. So I can always make sure I'm training on the right data set that I am intending. Um, because it's keeping track of all those changes. And this will play a bigger part as we go down the line from our raw ingestion to our filtered. And then as we aggregate it near the end, so we can show the end-to-end -end capabilities of, of our Lakehouse platform. So you can see that in a few lines, we're able to take those uh, CSVs of those data sets and import those into Delta tables. And that gets the jigsaw data loaded. Then we're also going to loop through and load the Dota 2 data set and load those into Delta as well. And so what we should have is about eight tables um, inside our gaming database that, that show chat, the cluster regions, match, match outcomes, et cetera. And we want to make sure that these tables actually have data in it that we did load. So I've included um, a relationship diagram that shows how we can start to combine and look in this data. Now this doesn't have any of the toxicity predictions in it. Um, this is just the raw data itself. So if we combine a few tables, we can start to see number of players and number of chat messages per region. Um, we could also then begin to look at, you know, the players and the number of messages. You know, some players are far more chatty than others. And so while this doesn't have any labeling on it, this can already start to provide us some insight into um, issues, such as uh, we have a data quality issue around um, a lot of messages being towards the zero account ID, which just means that um, down the stream, we would need to solve that or exclude that out from our analysis on when we're trying to tackle this. But none of this is to deal with the actual machine learning model yet. Our next notebook, we're gonna go through the simple classification. In the accelerator, we also included advanced classification, which uh, includes things like hyperparameter tuning and cross-validation. In this simple classification, though, we wanted to get immediately to, to the value and show what the impact could be out of these 50,000 matches. So it's important to note in configuration of the environment in this particular accelerator, we're leveraging Databricks Runtime 7.6 ML, and we're leveraging Spark NLP from John Snow Labs and the GPU version of that as well, because the underlying multi-classifier is in TensorFlow. Um, it leverages GPU training uh, quite a bit. Critical configuration to add is part of the Cairo serializer. So we're, we're setting um, the parameters for that. You, you can add that into your cluster configuration. Otherwise, you'll pretty quickly get an error. And just to give a little bit of numbers, because GPUs are expensive to provision, um, we, we had seen a, reduc a massive reduction in time when leveraging GPU for the training aspect of this. So we had seen uh, one third of the time compared to CPU training. So that's the reason why we are leveraging in this accelerator whenever we do our training. But when it comes to the inferencing, we, um, you can leverage any of your general purpose or whatever may be spe specifically applicable to you. 
And we're loading a series of libraries such as uh, MLflow, uh, PySpark libraries, and Spark NLP uh, that we'll use as we go through this. So right off the bat, let's open up this training data set that we data loaded from Jigsaw. And we can see that we have our hot encoded labels that uh, are important to the comment text. We've chose a, a non-toxic comment here uh, so that we're not enjoying the fun reading of, 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 of some pretty toxic uh, uh, <laughs> words in this data set. And we're gonna do a little bit of transformation and split this data set. And so what this is gonna look like in the training uh, split, we're gonna see that we've added um, labels column as well as a labels true, which is gonna be important for the evaluator later. And like I said, this is not a toxic comment, so it should have all of this uh, zero or empty in the labels scenario. So now that we have our training and our test data set split, let's actually define out the model pipeline. Like I said, we're using Spark NLP and in this accelerator, we've linked out to all the documentation around the transformers and annotators that we're leveraging in this. But the overall part of the pipeline is good, that goes from data frame with the text, and that could be your chat log. Um, it, it could be uh, in, in, in streaming or in batch in the scenario, but it's important that we feed this into document assembler, which is uh, preparing the, the actual text and formatting in a way that it can separate out the word embeddings in this. In this case, we're using universal embeddings. Um, in the advanced classifier, where we actually are leveraging universal and BERT in the hyperparameter tuning that. These embeddings, um, separating out the words, getting them into vectors that the multi-classifier can read and understand. And we define that out in this cell 15. And then at the end of the pipeline, we have a model that we can then take in, do our training on. So this is just preparing that pipeline. But to talk about the, the end of that pipeline, which is the multi-classifier, you can see that we have a, a wrapped neural network in this scenario in which we're specifying the columns, we're specifying the epochs, the batch size, the threshold, the learning rate, all of these things. Um, now in this simple classification, we're hard coding those values in, and in the advanced, we would obviously show the um, tuning capabilities of specifying different batch sizes and learning rates. Um, and you could look at the other notebook for that. And at the end, we have a definition of an end-to-end -end pipeline. So our stages are document assembler, universal embeddings, and the classifier. So now we have a pipeline uh, for a model. Well, let's look at our pipeline for the training. So we are going to take the, the actual Delta data, uh, Delta Lake data that we had from the jigsaw we're going to leverage the, the Spark ML lib and John Snow Labs Spark NLP. We're going to leverage ML flow as a framework to track uh, these experiments and then register the model once we're done with that uh, so that we could use it in the inferencing part in, in the last notebook. So here we're creating the ML flow client, setting an experiment to the user's folder, as well as beginning to auto log any uh, um, Spark settings as well. So this is gonna get like our data versions. So we're leveraging Delta. We know what version of the data we were training on so we could reproduce that later. And you should be able to see in your home directory now an actual experiment and, and we can begin to track all the different settings as we do our training. So let's get into the training. Um, it is actually, a consolidated amount of code here. There's really not a lot of code to do all this because we're leveraging ML flow, we're leveraging Delta. Uh, we built our model pipeline above. So we're gonna start our ML flow runtime. We're gonna log the parameters that we assigned above. We're gonna take our pipeline and, and fit it so that we can take and get our model out of that. So we're gonna pass over the training data. Once that is done training, we're gonna log our model um, to model registry. And you can see that we're doing a registered model name as toxicity multi-label classification. And we have an evaluator, right? So we trained, now we want to do our evaluation. And we're using the PySparks multi-label classification evaluator. It's a lot to say, um, but we're going to take that and get our F1 score from that. And in the advanced classification, 
this would, uh, the uh, multi-label classification evaluator would get our um, averaged weighted F1 score across all the parameters. And then we're gonna end our run. So this comes to the end of the notebook, but what's going to be important is that you're gonna have two pieces of, of information now, one being in your experiment in which you can track the artifacts from the model and the F1 score that we're wanting in the, as well as the parameters. Then we also will have a toxicity model here and we can see that we have two versions of this. So going back to the notebook, um, we're ready to actually, we've trained our model, we've registered it and, and now let's actually do some inferencing on this. Mm -hmm. So in the fourth notebook, we configure the environment by just loading up ML flow and loading our model. Uh, so we go out and grab the latest version of our model and you could define certain stages such as production or um, uh, archive, however you want to organize your, the model you want to pull in. We're just grabbing the latest model. And in this particular flow, uh, we're taking our data from various sources. It could be, like I said, streaming or batch. Um, and then we're going to pull that data in inference that, and it could be in real time or in batch, and then store that back into a table that we can combine with the rest of our data. So in this case, we're using uh, our structured streaming API, and we're actually gonna tell it to run once here because we only need one API and we can do real time streaming as well as uh, batch in our lake house. So you can see a couple lines to begin reading the stream from the chat data, and this could easily hook up to Kafka or uh, any other inventing mechanism. This is the meat of the stream itself where we get a data frame out of reading the stream in and we're calling um, the the actual prediction on this. So we'd call the model.transform on the data frame itself that's coming out of that read. And then we're writing that data frame back out to table. So it's going to incrementally uh, process and and uh, perform the inferencing and put it on the you know in table. And what we, what we get is a table that now has predicted. Like I said, the first one isn't toxic, um, which is great. We don't want to see that. We just want to be able to work off of it down, down the line. So now we have an actual predicted column. And then we, we now have a table that is refined a little bit. So we've taken our chat data. Now we've added our predicted column to it. And so we kind of have our silver uh, table in... Um, that we've enhanced our chat data with, with some type of labeling. Now we can move on to enriching our, our business data, in this case, our Dota 2 game data, by taking that same data set. And now that we've applied the labels to it, we can start to look at things such as number of toxic messages and players per region. We can look at the number of toxic messages versus non-toxic. We can drill into the toxicity uh, types itself, such as of the 92,000, um, 48,000 were considered obscene as well or insult um, and smaller amounts of threat, identity, hate, and severe toxic. We can also see the number of labels. Um, some, some people have gotten crazy in their chat messages and just decided to check all the boxes on the toxicity chart. And we can, we can see that. We can see the percentages as well, 58% of the, the the messages that were toxic, 42 of those, 42% of that was also obscene. And one of the, the more interesting uh, uh, graphs here is that when you start to break out the amount of toxic messages based off of the time, you can see that players were already experiencing toxic messages before the game even started in the game lobby. And as the game actually progressed on, these matches progressed on, they encountered more toxic messages. Um, with an average time being 30 to 40 minutes, you can see that the beginning of the game is uh, going to have less encounters and the latter part of the game is going to have more. You can see the who has produced the most toxic messages. So you can grab these two data sets now from your, your silver and your bronze data and you can start to aggregate into business level aggregates. And in the Lake House, you can actually look at that in, in SQL Analytics. So instead of looking at it in a notebook, you can create a dashboard out of it and um, address each of these different things um, on a refresh schedule. So if you're tackling, you know, dealing with certain players that maybe you have a support team that's going out and reviewing their logs um, manually, you can look 
on the right and see the top 10 toxic players. But you can see all those same charts that we created uh, in the notebook, you can have in a dashboard as well. So you can end to end see the landscape of your data, where toxicity is and how to address that. And that's, that's really gonna take us to the end of this presentation. And we're just trying to take a very human, uh, typically, like a typically done approach uh, through a human. And a lot of these companies in these games, scale has become enormous and we are needing to leverage machine learning to, to help refine and keep our communities clean and enjoyable for players. So appreciate uh, everyone joining and you can download the accelerator um, at the link on the screen. So thanks for joining. That was great, Duncan. And now for our last demo of the day, Tushar Madden, Senior Solutions Architect at Databricks, will walk through how to build content recommendation engines. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about building recommendation systems using factorization machines, which is a new solution accelerator that we are introducing as a part of media and entertainment uh, vertical within Databricks. My name is Tushar Madan, and I'm a senior solution architect working for Databricks uh, out of New York. A quick coverage of topics that we would be covering as a part of the solution accelerator are common modeling approaches for building recommendation systems, challenges and mitigation strategies for improving your recommendation systems. We'll then talk about factorization machines, which is an extremely exp uh, expressive and scalable approach to building your recommendation models in a distributed environment. We'll also touch about evaluation metrics that can be used to evaluate your recommendation outside of just accuracy. And then talking about scaling and deploying these recommendation systems in an environment like Databricks, uh, which provides you both scalable data engineering and a low ops uh, machine learning deployment uh, architecture. So firstly, just to cover the various modeling approaches available with recommendation systems, uh, they typically fit into these two classes of models called collaborative filtering and content-based approaches. And the unique difference between these is the fact that for collaborative filtering models, we usually use these user item representations, which are learned as a part of the model training exercise. Uh, and this is something that is derived from the uh, behavior of users, uh, past behavior of users and how they have interacted with the data in the past. Uh, whereas for content-based approaches, we use explicit features for both users and items and typically model these problems as a regression or classification problems. There are many common challenges that we encounter with both these types of approaches, uh, such as you know, the cold start problem where you don't have a lot of data on users and items, user and item bias, where certain users are very generous towards uh, rating products, whereas other users are not, not so much. And then there is also a temporal element to user behavior, such as evolving user traits or seasonal demand for certain items. And we talk about addressing these using many different mitigation strategies as a part of the solution accelerator, which is explored further uh, in a collection of notebooks that we will be sharing with you. Broadly, these approaches translate into a content-based or a collaborative filtering model. But in reality, for most production systems, we end up using a hybrid approach and usually end up combining these different models uh, into some sort of an ensemble uh, to serve predictions to our users. This introduces a new problem, which is how much emphasis to pay on content-based approaches versus collaborative filtering approaches, and leads to a very complex architecture in production. We have found that a simpler option is to deploy a model called factorization machines, which helps you create a single expressive model that has both terms for capturing content-based features as well as it learns certain embeddings based on user behavior. So it essentially is a more flexible model uh, and reduces the amount of complexity in terms of combining these different modeling approaches together in a production setup. This also helps us inject side information, which is explicit features about both users as well as items. And it also provides a very nicely scalable approach, which can be distributed easily 
um, horizontally on a cluster. Uh, we'll also talk about the Spark 3.4, uh, 3.0 implementation of this model. Um, then, as a part of the notebooks, we also discuss various alternative evaluation metrics for these recommendation systems, such as relevance, uh, coverage, uh, which refers to the range of products that your recommendations uh, system serve uh, to your users, given your entire item base, diversity and novelty of those recommendations. Uh, we then show how you can visualize the data as well as your model training parameters within Databricks and how to, how to create these tuning and model training pipelines uh, within our notebooks. We also show certain aspects of CI, CD and ML ops uh, on the platform, such as how do we register and promote models within Databricks and serve them as REST endpoints. Overall, Databricks allows us to deliver a scalable data engineering pipeline to create these variety of features that you might need for your recommendation systems, and also a reproducible and simplified ML ops pipelines which help you to both deploy your models and monitor them in production. We hope you really take advantage of this new solution accelerator, and we hope to see you at the summit. Thank you. That was a great demo. Thank you both of our presenters. And that concludes our industry forum. Thank you all for tuning in. And if you're interested in seeing some more of our uh, solution accelerators, be sure to stop by the Solutions Theater. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you.